So why did the ancients go to so much trouble to build these megalithic monuments, do you think? Um, I think that astronomy is just one of the issues. Uh, and to think of them as astronomical observatories is a very limited view. And uh, I've been working in this field for 50 years now. And I believe that the purpose of building these circles and other ancient monuments was to enhance the possibility of spiritual connection. So why do you think, you know, in relation to what you just said, why do you think these sites have such a powerful effect on people? Well, because they are built in beautiful areas. They are constructed uh, with magnificent stonework. And uh, they concentrate the energies that are there. And on specific days, they really concentrate the energies. And uh, uh, we don't know what they were up to. And I think that mystery is what really brings people in. I mean, when you go to Avebury or someplace like that, what were they doing there? And I think that's one of the awe questions that really grabs you. Do you think the people who built these sites, do you think they were leaving us a message for today? I think the people who were building these sites were in the process of forgetting how to get in touch with the spiritual. As they moved closer and closer to the Greeks, they um, uh, got more and more into their what we call the left brain, the analytical side, and the irrational side, uh, which has got a pejorative uh, connotation these days, uh, was what they were working towards. And um, they built these sites because it helped them regain that spiritual connection. How do you think that the people who built the sites actually constructed them? Very carefully. <laughs> uh, well, I've worked with a guy named Ivan Macbeth. I think you know Ivan. And uh, we've moved some pretty big stones with just a few, few guys. And uh, so I think that it is possible to move tons and tons of stones uh, of a boulder uh, if you do it right on rollers and rails and things of that nature. But I also suspect there was something akin to a levitation going on as well. Bladewood uh, was Jeffrey of Monmouth talked about Bladewood, who was uh, out, I, I see him. Uh, surfing on one of his standing stones when an eclipse came and he fell to his death. And uh, so I think they were moving, moving them. They get lighter when you do it right. So do you think they had a more advanced technology than us regarding building these sites? Uh, the term primitive savage to me means a culture that's more spiritually advanced than we are. And I think that they knew all kinds of things that we gave the Greeks credit for, but they knew them better than the Greeks did thousands of years before then. Why do you think the stars, the sun, and the moon were so important to the people who built these sites? Well, <clears throat> it wasn't to know when to plant their seeds, even though it came with the, uh, uh, the revolution, the, the uh, Neolithic revolution. Uh, it was to know when the energies were going to be at their hottest. Uh, at, a, at a place like Rollwright, for example, where uh, Paul Devereaux did so much work, uh, it isn't hot year-round. There are certain times of the year when it's really buzzing, and then other times of the year when the ultrasound, which is what his measurement stick was, uh, died away. So it was to know when was the best time to get in touch. And why do you think the sites were aligned over such vast distances with like, you know, grids and ley lines and, mm. and that kind of phenomenon? I don't know. Uh, I have not focused on the, uh, the big picture. I've focused on single sites. Uh, but they do seem to be aligned over a long distance and uh, the lays, which were Watkins' alignments of sites, um, do, do go quite away. Because in some of your research, you, you talk about different variations on lays, like energy lays, and there's obviously the things like telluric currents yeah. and yeah. classic earth energies. Can you just give us a quick outline of um, the difference? 
when I first came over here uh, knowing what I'm into now, uh, John Michelle in the 70s told me, Sig, don't call these things that you're dowsing lays because uh, they're not lays. And he was absolutely correct. Uh, sometimes a lay, which is an alignment of, of sacred sites, has energy flowing along it and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, energy lays, which is I began to call these things that I was dowsing, which are six to eight foot wide beams of yang energy that have a direction of flow uh, and cross like spokes on a wheel over uh, power centers like Stonehenge or wherever. Um, the problem comes with a term that I heard you use called ley lines. I don't know what a ley line is. And it's because when people use the term, I'm not sure whether they're talking about an alignment of sites, whether they're talking about the thing you douse, or assuming that they're both always the same. Uh, I did my master's work in New England, and there were all kinds of energy lays over there, and very few lays that we could find uh, because, well, colonial man, Europeans did real good jobs of getting rid of all that stuff. You've been researching the sites in Holland and Scandinavia. Um, how do these sites relate to other sites, like in England or other parts of the world? <clears throat> well, uh, they're similar uh, in some cases and in others not particularly identical. For example, in here we have stone rings, if you will, uh, with various geometrical shapes of them, but they're essentially roughly circular, not exactly, although uh, Broadgar is, is, is a circle and Mary Maidens is a circle and Stonehenge is a circle, but most of them aren't true circles. But in Sweden, they're that shape. They're vesica-shaped, not vesica Pisces, but vesica-shaped. And uh, they're called ship settings. They're, they're, they're shaped like a Viking boat, if you will. Uh, so that's really different. And yet, on the other hand, uh, like Silbury Hill, uh, which is a, a truncated cone, um, they're, they, they are over in Holland and they're over in Sweden as well. Uh, over here we have these things called dolmens or cromlechs. Uh, in the Netherlands there are a few of them, but many more uh, hunebeden, which are giant's graves they're called, and they're series of uh, these dolmens, series of, of perched rocks, perched rocks, per long tunnels of them. Um, so they're similar and yet different. Why do you think academia and traditional archaeology um, doesn't accept the more esoteric and the more, I mean, even just the archaeoastronomy, for instance? Mm -hmm. how, what, why do they not accept these disciplines that have come about? Um, listen, I went to school for uh, 20 years to become a PhD in archaeology. And you're trying to tell me that these primitive savages knew about astronomy? You're, tr you're trying to tell me that they knew about geometry before the Greeks invented it? Um, it's really hard to get people to switch their paradigms. And uh, some very brave folks have been working on getting that to happen. I'm not really interested in convincing them of anything. I'm not a researcher. I'm a seeker. I'm a pilgrim. And uh, so I want to have the experience rather than the, I want to have both actually. I want to have the rational information and I want to have the experiential evidence of these sites. I call that gnowing, which is from Gnostic, but you got to say the G or you don't hear it. And it's both rational and intuitive, but valuing them equally, which is something that academicians don't always do, although the, the really good ones work that way a lot. Einstein was very intuitive and others, Eureka kind of moments. Um, so they have difficulty accepting this. Also, the New Age, we're sitting in the capital of what used to be the New Age here in Glastonbury in the 1980s, mid-80s, when I first got here. And it's been given a bum rap. And uh, so they don't want to have to accept all this weird stuff. And um, God doesn't move needles on demand. I'm interested in the work you did some time ago in New England, because over there there's obviously lots of megalithic mm -hmm. sites. Mm -hmm. um, can you just um, tell us a little bit about 
those sites and mm -hmm. how, how important they are? Well, um, I did my master's work on underground uh, stone chambers. Do you think there's a resurgence in megalithomania happening on the planet right now? Yeah, I do. I think that uh, there was a real dry period in uh, the late 80s and early 90s. <clears throat> uh, and quite a divisive time happened there. Uh, dowsing, for example, got really knocked hard back then. Uh, but I think now we've overcome that and we're uh, moving along. And dowsing is a tool that helps me feel and experience it. It's a tool that helps you experience it. But it, I, I can't convince you until you experience it for yourself. And regarding the work of John Michel and his book Megalithomania, um, what do you sort of feel about the way he kind of opened up a lot of doors into the world, you know, for people really, mm -hmm. to get into the study of mm -hmm. earth mysteries and megalithic arts and sciences? I can't say enough about John. He was a very good friend of mine. And his uh, view over Atlantis, which most recently is the new view over Atlantis, uh, really opened my eyes. It was one of my seminal books. And at one time, I really had a good collection of all of his works. And he really did, he was a gentleman who really um, did a great deal to help us all learn more about what we're here to talk about this weekend, for example. Great man. We're in 2012 now. I thought you were about to leave then. <laughs> uh, can you repeat the question? John, John's question was, <clears throat> we're in the, you know, 2012 and everyone's kind of leading up towards the winter solstice. Where do you expect we'll be on the 22nd if we're still here and what, what, what do you look forward to in 2013 and beyond? Um, It's certainly well hyped, uh, and um, I think that uh, I have spent the last 20 years wanting a new age. I know we shouldn't use that word anymore, but in any event, I want one. And uh, I want to change our Earth, our, our, the way we operate as Western man and now more all over the planet uh, with this fundamentalist attitude, both in religion and with capitalism. And in business, it, it, we've got to have a change. And I feel more and more people are waking up. And uh, I don't know, I have no feeling about whether it's Armageddon or not. Uh, and whether winter solstice 2012 is going to be when it happens or not. Uh, it's happening already. And it will happen after 2012. Um, and if we all die, then I'm going to heaven and I'm happy. What can I say? My, my goal in life is to be at least one step closer to my maker than I am today, so maybe that'll be it. Uh, but I, I don't get too worried about it. Okay. Do you think there's a resurgence in megalithomania happening on the planet right now? Yeah, I do. I think that uh, there was a real dry period in uh, the late 80s and early 90s. <clears throat> And quite a divisive time happened there. Uh, dowsing, for example, got really knocked hard back then. Uh, but I think now we've overcome that and we're uh, moving along. And dowsing is a tool that helps me feel and experience it. It's a tool that helps you experience it. But it, I, I can't convince you until you experience it for yourself. And Regarding the work of John Michel and his book Megalithomania, um, what do you sort of feel about the way he kind of opened up a lot of doors into the world, you know, for people really, mm -hmm. to get into the study of mm -hmm. earth mysteries and megalithic arts and sciences? I can't say enough about John. He was a very good friend of mine. And his uh, view over Atlantis, which most recently is the new view over Atlantis, uh, really opened my eyes. It was one of my seminal books. And at one time, I really had a good collection of all of his works. And he really did, he was a gentleman who really um, did a great deal to help us all learn more about what we're here to talk about this weekend, for example. Great man. We're in 2012 now. I thought you were about to leave then. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, what, can you repeat the question? John, John's question was, <clears throat> we're in the, you know, 2012 and everyone's kind of leading up towards the winter solstice. Where do you expect we'll be on the 22nd if we're still here and what, what, what do you look forward to in 2013 and beyond? Um, it's certainly well hyped. Uh, and um, I think that uh, I have spent the last 20 years wanting a new age. I know we shouldn't use that word anymore, but in any event, I want one. And uh, I want to change. Our Earth, our, the way we operate as Western man and now more all over the planet uh, with this fundamentalist attitude, both in religion and with capitalism and in business, it, it, we've got to have a change. And I feel more and more people are waking up. And uh, I don't know, I have no feeling about whether it's Armageddon or not. Uh, and whether winter solstice 2012 is gonna be when it happens or not. Uh, it's happening already. And it will happen after 2012. Um, and if we all die, then I'm going to heaven and I'm happy. What can I say? My, my goal in life is to be at least one step closer to my maker than I am today, so maybe that'll be it. Uh, but I, I don't get too worried about it.